So what we were just talking about was interference that occurs in a thin film. And now we're going to talk about interference that occurs uh, with the double slit experiment. Interference always occurs when you have two different beams. How did we get the two different beams in the thin film? We had two different beams because one portion of the beam reflected from the first surface of the film, and the other portion of the beam reflected from the second surface of the film. All right, now we're going to have two different beams because one of the beams is going to go through the first slit, and the other beam is going to go through the second slit. Uh, and we'll assume that these two uh, uh, thin beams of light were in phase at the beginning. They're in phase at the beginning, but then they're getting split into two separate sources here. All right, and then when we, if we look at any particular spot on the screen, so I could pick any spot here, but let's say I pick this spot at random, that's going to get hit by light from the first screen and from the second screen. Remember, I could pick any spot. I'm just picking this spot at random. Any spot will get hit by light from the two slits, I should say, from the first slit and the second slit. But because these two pat um, rays are going different distances, they may cons interfere constructively or destructively. Okay. Uh, if they interfere constructively, we'll get a bright spot here. And if they interfere destructively, we'll get a dark spot. Actually, I should say, um, maybe I shouldn't say spot, because these are slits. So they're actually going to give us lines over here. Um, they actually give us lines <coughs> on the screen, because these are linear slits. But you can't really draw um, a line on the blackboard. So on the blackboard, it looks like a spot. So I'll probably just keep saying spots, even though they're kind of lines from the slits. So here's a bright spot, uh, or a dark spot. Uh, this would be a bright spot if these two rays were interfering constructively here, and it would be a dark spot if they were interfering uh, destructively. All right, uh, and there's a way to figure out the right formula for that. In fact, in the video you watched, we kind of proved what the right formula is, but I think for our purpose here, we'll just memorize the formulas. Um, so we need to know the formulas for the bright and the dark spots. So the bright spots occur when d sine theta is equal to m lambda, where m is 0, 1, 2, etc. And the dark spots occur where d sine theta is equal to m plus 1 half lambda. And now this is a case where m could be 0 in both equations. In the other video we watched, we actually kind of proved those equations, but we won't need to prove them again. It's always good to draw this center line that goes smack dab between the two slits. So what type of spot are we going to get at the center of the screen here? Dark or bright when you're ready? Uh, at the center you're going to get a bright spot. That's true. How do you know? Um, well, if they are, um, if the the slit distance is the same from the center of the mm -hmm. uh, That's right. imaginary line, then it's going to amplify it, or it's going to it's going to make a bright spot because they're about the same distance. They're going to be in phase. Okay. They're going to be traveling the same distance. There you go. Okay. So the more you talked, the clearer your explanation got. That's right. You're getting a clearer and clearer explanation. Remember that the two light beams started in phase. So the only thing that could get them out of phase here is if they travel different distances. These, um, so we don't have a situation here with inversions. We don't have any inversions because we're not traveling from one medium to another. So this is one way in which this is going to be easier than the thin films. I should have mentioned that. This whole problem is just in the air. This whole problem is in the air. So we never have to worry about reflecting off of something with a higher in index of refraction. So there won't be any inversions. So the only way these can get out of phase is if one of them traveled a longer distance than the other. But this spot is symmetrical, so they're clearly both traveling the same distance. So if they're in phase over here, they should be in phase over here. So this could, should clearly be a B for bright spot. That's the case when M is 0. For M equals 0, we would get this bright spot here. And then there's going to be a whole series of bright spots above and below. I won't draw the bright spots below, but there'll be symmetrical bright spots below as well. Um, yeah, so a lot of these problems are plug and chug type problems, so the key thing is to know what all the variables stand for. Um, so if you remember from watching that other series of videos, 
Um, who is D? D is the, uh, the distance between the center of the slit to the center of the other yeah. slit, correct? That's right. That's well put. Being to say D is the distance between the slits, but you're right. Maybe it's better to think of it as the distance between the centers of the slits. D is the distance between the centers of the two slits. D for distance. Of course, in most textbooks, they don't say that. They just say the center. They say the distance between the slits. Ah, that's right. But if you look at the pictures in your textbook, they're drawn with hash marks at the centers. Um, these should be very narrow slits, so maybe it makes no difference. The width of the slits should be much smaller than the distance between them, so maybe it will be negligible. All right, but we'll be very careful. All right, now, one of the things that gives people the most trouble, well, let, let's keep going. How about L? L is going to be the barrier to the screen, the distance yeah. between the barrier. Uh, I didn't double check to make sure these are the variables that your textbook uses, but this is pretty common to use L for that distance. Um, how about the distance between the bright spot and the center line? Uh, the bright spot and the center line would be Y. So from this bright spot to the center would be Y. So notice that there, or it actually doesn't have to be a bright spot, it could be a dark spot too. Whatever spot you're focusing on has a Y. So every spot has a different Y. So this spot over here, has a bigger Y than this spot down here. Every spot, there's only one L and one D for the single apparatus, but every spot has a different Y. Maybe the trickiest part is theta. Can you draw where the angle theta is? Theta is going to be the uh, angle from the imaginary center line to whatever bright spot it's connected to. Okay, good. You might as well erase these two rays there. That was just I'll a thought process. The So here would be our theta. This would be theta for this particular spot. But again, every spot has a different theta. This bright spot that's further away has a bigger theta, and dark spots would have thetas too. That's one of the trickiest things. So theta is, you have to draw the center line and then a, a line from the center to the spot. Okay, um, now oftentimes, uh, if the wavelength is much smaller than D, you can use the small angle approximation. When the wavelength is much smaller than D, this angle will be very small, and we can use the small angle approximation, which turns out to be This is another equation I proved in the other video, so we'll just take it on faith that this is the right equation uh, using the small angle approximations. With the same m's as before. actually not very hard to um, understand where these come from, but we talked about that in the other video, so we'll just write down these equations. Okay, so, uh, and how do you know when to use these? Well, for one thing, again, if you've got uh, wavelengths that are much smaller than D, that's when this is uh, appropriate. Um, but as a problem-solving technique, if the problem is talking about angles, you should probably use the sine theta version. But if the problem is talking about distances on the screen, you should probably use this one because it has y. So notice there's two different ways. So how do we indicate the position of the spots? How do we indicate the position of the spots? We have two ways of indicating the positions of the spots. We could talk about the angle that the spot is making, or we could talk about the y that the spot has, how high it is. Well, if the problem is focusing on the distance of the spot on the screen, they probably want you to use the small angle approximation. But if the problem is focusing on the angles that the spots are making with the center line, that's a clue that we should use the regular equation. Did I make a mistake? Uh, no, I'm just, uh, can you clarify your, uh, your notation there with the uh, wavelength? This? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I was trying to write, remember the small angle approximation works when the wavelength is much smaller than the distance. Okay. Mathematicians like to write that like this. Right. You know, this means smaller than, so a mathematician maybe with a sense of humor would say this means much smaller than. And they actually use this in the textbooks a lot. 
All right, so this is just a pompous way of saying that the wavelength should be much smaller than the distance here to use this version or this version. Okay, uh, small theta. But again, actually in practical terms, maybe when you're solving problems, you know to use this equation when the problem is focusing on distances on the screen. And you know to use this equation when they're talking about angles. Um, when m is 0, that's 0th order. When m is 1, that's first order. When m is 2, that's second order. When m is 3, that's third order, etc. Oftentimes people just skim the problem and they don't realize that the problem is telling, us, telling them what m is. If they tell you the order, they're telling you the m to plug into the equation. 